Hi, my name is Chrissy Yee, and I'm the Practice Management and Implementation Specialist for Euclid Systems Corporation. Euclid is known as a global leader in orthokeratology and myopia management. We are the makers of Euclid Emerald and Euclid Max lenses with proven lens designs and excellent material that are on millions of eyes around the world. Tonight is the conclusion of our three-part series, Building a Successful Myopia Management Practice. Tonight, we're going to cover one of the topics that I'm most passionate about, and that's introducing the concepts of myopia management to parents and conducting that myopia management consultation. Now, if you're just joining us and you missed parts one and two, we'll have them available online with information at the end of tonight's broadcast on how to find those. Also, I just want to do a little bit of general housekeeping. This is a really big topic, so we're going to cover some uh, basic pearls and um, give you some tips from our own experience, but this is ultimately for you. We're going to allot time at the end to answer your questions, so please use that chat function. We're going to get to as many of those as we can. Now, I'm super excited because to help me tonight, I'm joined by Dr. Bethany Fishbean. Um, Dr. Fishbean is the CEO of The Power Practice and host of the Power Hour Optometry Podcast. She's an optometrist and owner with two practices in central New Jersey. Doc, thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. Now, I know you've been practicing myopia management for a long time. When did you start and what was your motivation back then? Ooh, I think we probably started with myopia management um, maybe 2003-ish. Um, and I think we weren't thinking of it so much as myopia management at that time as we were thinking about it as ortho K, which sure. happened to seem to control myopia. Um, the motivation for starting was kind of a combination. Um, initially, it um, we were aware of the profitability of doing so. It seemed like a unique way. We had a brand new cold start practice at that time. It seemed like a unique way to differentiate ourselves. And also, we were seeing patient demand for it. So um, there was a group in the community that seemed to know about it and was asking for the services. And once we fit one of those, refer their their friends and um, some more people in that group. Yeah. So now, obviously, a lot of time has gone by. What has continued to feel that passion moving forward? Um, obviously, I, I'm assuming your uh, practice has kind of evolved throughout the years um, where you've tried to improve efficiencies and then also, um, you know, incorporating different modalities. Um, what, what does that look like today? It's quite different. Um, today in, in our practices, um, we really embrace myopia management as management of the total condition of myopia. So instead of just, I can fit you with this lens overnight, you're going to see in the morning, it's you're, you're five years old, you're not myopic yet, but you have risk factors. You're not as hyperopic as we'd like you to be. Your axial length is longer than we want it to be. You have two myopic parents. You're spending 10 hours a day on your uh, I, iPad. Um, so starting to embrace the concept of myopia treatment from first eye exam through that initial diagnosis of myopia and thinking about it as something that we're providing over the lifetime of a child. Yeah. So now are you incorporating more modalities in your treatment or is ortho -OK still your go-to uh, treatment modality for myopia management? We're absolutely incorporating more modalities. Um, ortho -OK is a preferred treatment for sure because it's the one that gives the benefit of not having to wear the glasses during the day. So it's fun. It's exciting. It's a more of a wow moment for patients than drops or daytime contact lenses, which sure. it's the wow is, oh, we took your axial length. It didn't change. It doesn't quite have the, oh, my gosh, I can see that ortho -OK does. Yeah. Um, but we're really using those singularly or sometimes in combination, depending on what's best for the patient clinically and what's best for the family based on what they're willing and wanting to do. Sure. And um, can you like describe your office process? So when you or um, you know, one of your colleagues identifies a patient that you think, you know, man, this, this is going to be a really great myopia management candidate, you know, for all the reasons you just described. So you know, whether that's risk factors of having, 
you know, to myopic parents or, you know, more of that myopic lifestyle where there's a lot of indoor time, a lot of tablet time, you know, like what, what does that process look like when you've identified that potential candidate? Um, can you kind of walk us through those steps that your, you and your colleagues take when kind of introducing that concept? Sure. The first thing that happens is um, we've created a diagnosis code in our system for a myopia management candidate, MMC is what we call it. And what that does when we code someone as a myopia management candidate, it puts them in the system to know that we've started this conversation. And so then later, if we're we're pulling information for marketing, we're doing a webinar, we want to reach out to myopes, there's a new study or whatever it is, we've got an easily accessible list of people and families who are going to benefit from this information. So the first thing that we're doing is coding them not only as my, myopic, but as a myopia management candidate. In the exam room, um, my colleagues are seeing the patient and have the mindset that myopia at any level is something that should spark a conversation for treatment. So we've really embraced that the time to start talking about it is immediately with the risk factors. Sometimes, like I said, before that first pair of glasses with a new patient, whether they're an emerging myope, whether their prescription changed from last year, or even if it didn't, we want to make sure that nobody leaving the office doesn't know that there's more that can be done than getting a stronger pair of glasses or getting a stronger pair of contacts. So I think embracing that as doctors and also as staff steers the conversation in a different way. Okay, you know, you, you're, you're complaining about blurry vision. It's hard to see the board. We want to address the blurry vision, but we also want to address the problem of this progression that is likely to happen if we don't do anything. So we're always addressing those together. Logistically, what we want from that exam is for the patient and the parents to understand that this is something that we're going to want to treat. And there are different methods of treatment. We set up a consultation for some more measurements to be done, some more information to be given, and it's time to have that discussion about what treatment the doctor is going to recommend, what what the family is going to need to do to implement that treatment and make sure it's successful for the child. Yeah. Um, so I, I really love what you stressed there. So like the key takeaway there was focus on the eye care and not necessarily in the eyewear part of it. So, um, you know, really making certain you're addressing that underlying cause versus just treating those symptoms with a stronger pair of glasses or contacts. Yeah. I mean, um, I, honestly, Chrissy, I think it's both. And yeah. the reason that I, I jump in and say that so strongly is because we did shift to treatment of the condition and not just the vision. Right. And what happened, what we realized was that we were, were so into talking about myopia treatment and, you know, you could do this and you could do this and we need the consult that people were leaving with the same blurry vision they came in with. So it it's almost like you can't, when there is a prescription change, you can't do one or the other. Yeah. You have to address both because even if a child's entering myopia treatment and is going to be fit with ortho K lenses, there's going to be occasions where the kid has a cold for a couple of days. Oh, they don't feel like something yep. happens. They need to have an updated pair of glasses. Right. And we've all probably seen ortho K kids get to be 17 and they come in with their glasses from fourth grade and they're unwearable. Right. Yep. Um, and we're going to give them clear vision and a plan to keep their eyes as healthy as possible and their prescription as low as possible for the rest of their teenage years. I think yeah. they go together. Yeah, no, 100 percent agree with you on that, too. And the other thing, too, that um, I like to stress in my office, especially with the ortho K and, and the younger children, is that we've taken uh, kids out of ultraviolet protecting polycarbonate materials um, and given them the ortho K. And so the nice thing is, is that during the day they they don't have to wear glasses, but we still want to make certain that they are still utilizing some sort of ultraviolet sun protection when they're when they're outdoors, just to make certain that they're they're still protected. 
Um, so going back to like your consultation. So I know you said that you schedule consultations, um, you know, to kind of go over myopia management in greater detail. Do you always schedule a consultation after you introduce the concepts of myopia management? Is that um, a, a separate uh, appointment where you bring the patients in on a separate day and really dedicate time for that? Um, or is that something that you're doing at the end of the day exam? 90% of the time, the consultation is a separate visit. And the reason that we do it like that is that for most parents, this is a lot of new information being thrown at them all at once, right? Still, and it's changing, but it's changing slowly. So still most parents coming in with a myopic child, if it's their first time in the office, they haven't seen a doctor talking about myopia treatment before, they're coming in fully expecting to walk out with a new pair of glasses. And in their head, the visit's probably going to cost about however much it cost last year, right? Depending yeah. on their insurance and what kind of glasses they pick. So to throw out the idea that myopia is not just something about glasses and it's something that we need to treat and it can be linked to these scary eye diseases and throw out retina detachment and you know now you're going to need to do treatment and, and there are choices and it's going to cost a few thousand dollars is absolute overload. Mm -hmm. So for those parents, we're really just trying to establish this is something we can treat you have an option you didn't know about. There's something we can do for your kid that your parents couldn't do for you. Let's set up an appointment. We're gonna talk a lot more about it. And we give them information at the end of that visit that has lifestyle recommendations, but it has specifics on here are the recommended treatments that we use. So they can read that in between, formulate some questions, but they know kind of what the menu is we're picking from. We put pricing information in there so they know when they come in for the consult, the approximate cost of treatment. So when they come in for that consult, they've acknowledged this is something we wanna treat and they've educated themselves a little bit about the options. Maybe they've done some online research, maybe they've spoken to people. And so the the questions that they're asking are much more sophisticated and are much more likely to lead to a better outcome. Right. Um, so you feel like doing it that way, you've increased your overall like capture success rate? Yeah, because a parent who's never heard anything about this is pretty unlikely, I think, within the time that most ODs have allotted for a routine eye exam, going to get from completely unknowledgeable to here's my credit card right? in that time. Now, there are exceptions. So exceptions for us are occasionally you run into a new patient who you introduce it and the parent says they have to get glasses. What else can be done? Yep. And then we say, here's what else can be done. They say, how much is it? You tell them and they say, let's do that. And so we're not like stuck on you have to do a consultation. Right. There are those. There are kids where we've talked about it last year. They weren't ready to do it. Parents weren't ready to do it. They wanted to wait and watch the myopia get worse a year before they did anything. And sometimes they come in saying, okay, he's blurry again. We're ready. Yeah. So those are usually very easy to convert from the exam. And then sometimes as our um, myopia patient base has grown, somebody comes in as a new patient specifically interested in the service, and then we don't have to go through that process. They've talked to their neighbor, they know what they're doing, the neighbor kind of did our job educating, and then we just need to take some measurements and, and start treatment. Sure. Now, um, I've, I've talked to some doctors who have different thoughts on um, like having the pricing on, on the sheets. Um, when, when you do the myopia management consultations, um, do you find that for the most part, the patients that are coming in for the consultations are, are the ones that are more likely to move forward with um, 
the the actual treatment just because you've been up front with all the pricing and um you know it was just very direct you know they, they had no surprises going forward with that we do and it you could argue it both ways, right? Yeah. We certainly have people who don't come for the consult because we charge for the consult and we've told them about the pricing for treatment in, up front. Mm -hmm. And they've already made the decision, probably without having all of the information, they've made the decision, it's too much, we're not doing it. And so we never get the opportunity to give all of the information Sure, that happens. This is where going back that myopia code comes in because then they get an email about a webinar we're doing and if they're interested, they can choose to join and there's no cost for that. And then they get to hear the information, not individually one on one related to their child with their questions, but we usually keep them small enough that they have the opportunity to ask questions and they can get all of the information in a zero commitment way, I guess, right? Sure. So we do lose some there, but the consults are are time intensive. We schedule those to allow for the parent to be able to ask all of the questions that they have. And I know the people that are listening to this are, are working with myopia treatment parents, and you know they have a lot of questions. Question. And so for us to allocate that time, we want that time to be time spent that results in us being able to help that child and not time spent that results in frustration on both ends where we know we can make a difference. The parent says, oh, we, we can't do this. We don't want to do this. Or because there's no cost to it, they don't, don't show up to it. It doesn't have value for them. So for us and our schedule doing the console the way we do pushes a little bit of self-selection that that works for us. Sure. And um, just for everybody who's listening, um, what do you think the appropriate time allotment is for a myopia management consultation? I think it depends where you as a practitioner are in your myopia conversation journey. I'm I'm thinking about my my partner Tobin who runs the myopia program in our office. And I think when he first started, he was setting up an hour and a half or an hour and 45 minutes for these consults. And he was using all of that time. He's a, a study guy, you know, given all the information. And as he refined his consultation, it got shorter and shorter and shorter because we were giving more information beforehand. And he he got better at his presentation to give the information that parents needed and then to let them direct the rest of the conversation. So now um, I think he schedules an hour, but he's probably taking about 40 minutes. Okay. And then how, how does your staff um, help with these uh, myopia management consultations? Are they involved in any part of the process? Do they help you guys take the scans? or the scans taken pre, pri, like prior to the actual consultation, what does that flow look like at the clinic? Um, the staff absolutely helps us get that done. And the fun part about the staff being involved, especially our technicians, is we have a lot of our technicians who are pre-optometry students taking a gap year, kind of do, getting some work experience before going into optometry. And almost universally, they come out wanting to do myopia care because they get to be in the exam room. They're the ones taking acuity the morning after somebody yeah. started wearing ortho K lenses. They're the ones who they they put in the blood, sweat, and tears of teaching somebody to put those lenses in their eyes. Hopefully not too much blood, but there's sweat and tears, <laughs> right? And they do that. And then they see the child a week later come in and and they're the ones saying, read the smallest line on the chart you can. So our t our the whole staff is helping because the the front desk staff is taking the calls. They're sometimes identifying the patients, especially new patients that call. They're putting them on the schedules of the doctors who do myopia treatment in the practice. Um, they're scheduling the consults. They're asking the questions that the parents 
they're answering the questions the parents forgot to ask at the front desk. They're sometimes re-explaining pricing. And then our techs are um, doing the autorefractor, the topography, the axial lens. They're checking the acuity. They're the ones asking, how's it going? They're taking the case history. They're doing the contact lens lessons. And so they're very involved with these patients all the way through as well. Excellent. Um, so one of the other things that I wanted to really kind of touch on was, um, especially with orthokeratology um, and capture rates is language for success. Um, because I know that this was something that I initially struggled with and um, kind of looking at my own capture rate was a little bit lower than what I had initially wanted, especially with the orthokeratology. And so I'd actually heard somebody else talking and I was like, well, who would choose that? And then I started actually thinking about how I presented uh, orthokeratology to parents. And, and again, like you're wanting to set reasonable expectations of what the child is going to experience. And so, you know, I was like, well, you know, these are hard lenses. Okay. So that was like my first mistake. And, and then like, you know, obviously you're, you're, you're going to, you're going to feel them. There's going to be some lens awareness and your eyes go to water and you're probably going to want to take them out and don't worry. It gets better. It wasn't terribly reassuring. So, um, you know, you're kind of like subconsciously talking parents out of, um, uh, you know, you, you going forward with orthokeratology, even just, you know, by trying to set reasonable expectations. So, um, it, you know, in your practice, how have you guys kind of um, set those reasonable expectations, but done so in, in a positive and, you know, kind of reassuring manner so that the parents understand what the child is going to go through, but they're not actually like apprehensive of starting the program? Yeah, what what you're describing and, and true, um, our work as consultants, we're observing in a lot of practices and a lot of practices, right? The goal is to increase the number of patients in a specialty and for the practices doing myopia, that's that's the specialty. And so we observe a lot of doctors giving that presentation to parents. And so we're hearing the nuance. And one of the biggest things people do is they there's there's some expectation setting in a negative way, which which you described fairly accurately. Yeah. Um, the other thing that we see is people talking about uh, the features versus benefits. We have that conversation all the time. So if they're not talking about something that's going to be hard and uncomfortable and make your eyes water and all of that, they're talking about a you know, rigid gas permeable lens with a, a flat central curve and a steep peripheral curve in order to create reshaping of the cornea and create some peripheral defocus and right. And the parents yep. can't stop listening. <laughs> they stop listening, right? Yeah. So when you're making the initial decision with the parents, it's all benefit focused, right? This is a lens. They're going to wear it at night. It keeps all the contact lens care in the home. They're wearing it while they sleep. They wake up. They take it out. They see clearly all day. They don't need to wear glasses during the day. And it slows the progression of myopia. Right. All good. As they get into the questions, one of the questions is very often, what does it feel like? Are they uncomfortable? And that's where you tell them, you got to be honest, you're going to feel it at first. When we put this in, we're putting something in your eye. You haven't had, you're not used to that. You're going to feel it. The beauty is though, when you close your eyes, that's when the feeling goes away yeah. and you're going to wear these with your eyes closed. So the adjustment happens while you're asleep. If the parents don't ask, then we're having that conversation at the beginning of the fit with the child. Okay, we're gonna put them in, you're gonna feel them. It's gonna feel like there's something in your eye because there is something in your eye, right? And they usually yep. laugh. And when they do it and they feel it and they say, ah, oh, it feels like something's in my eye. You say, okay, close your eyes. Does that help? Yeah, that feels a little bit better. Great, because you're here, we're gonna ask you to open your eyes, but at home, you just get to leave them closed sure. and they're okay with that. And so one of the, one of the things that um, comes up a lot when I'm, when I'm talking to optometrists is do you use prepare during that initial insertion 
um, do, you not, do you numb the eye to take visual acuities and to check your fit? Um, and, and just so that the child has a, a more positive uh, first experience with the lens? Or do you prefer to just put it in uh, with the eye anesthetized and, and just, uh, you know, again, they, they get a real world firsthand experience of, of what that lens is going to feel like at home? Um, so, in, in our office, they do both. Um, more often than not, we're not using preparacaine um, because that's a whole other thing. Now the lens feels better, but they're upset about the drop and yeah. that burns and their eyes are tearing from that. And so it's before they even put it in, we've created some discomfort. I think it's also important to just thinking about it as a parent, if my child needs um, assistance or something different in the office, I'm thinking, well, I, I don't have that drop at home. What's this going to be like? So for me, it feels like just do it. That being said, there are those kids where you put the lens in and they're freaking out and you tell them, I can put a drop in. The drop's going to sting a little bit. It's going to make this feel more comfortable. Would you like that? And we put the control in their hands. And some kids say no. And some kids say yes. And then we do it. But then we're practicing a little bit longer, usually long enough to tell them, okay, so now you're much more used to it. Sometimes it's just the, the shock, I guess, or the initial yeah. like uncertainty about what it's going to feel like. So they use it when needed, um, but not as a routine practice. Right. So we're kind of coming up on a half an hour here. Um, I, I want to make certain we have time to get to some questions. But um, before we turn it over to questions, I wanted to ask you, so you've been doing this now for 20 years, so that's a lot of experience. If there were any tips or suggestions that you could provide somebody who is just starting out in relation to having that myopia management conversation with parents, um, what would it be? I think um, my advice would be to really work to understand the mindset of the parent who's bringing their child in. You hear people talking about parents of kids in myopia treatment in almost a negative tone, right? They want perfect children. They want... Um, they're willing to stop at nothing. They want only the, the best for their children. And if you think about it, those are really positive qualities that most parents have. So to the parents who are likely to say yes to myopia treatment, the ones who are most interested, to them, their, their child has something that can be corrected. And as a parent, I'm not going to sit and let my kid knowingly get worse on anything, right? So if I don't have to do that, I'm going to do it. I'm not going to do it. And there are choices. I know there are because I've done some research or I've read the material. So understanding that parents mindset and what they're asking when they're sounding panicked when the kid tries to put a lens in and it takes a little bit longer than expected and the kid's frustrated and the parents frustrated being able to think that this kid has probably not struggled with too much in their life in their life they're a healthy overachieving child who's pretty good at most things those skills don't translate into putting a foreign object in your eye. Um, the other piece of advice, or if we want to edit, it can be the only piece of advice, <laughs> is to, as the doctor, be ready to make a decision about what you feel is the best course of treatment for the child. And 
be confident in that decision. There are some kids where it's not a choice, right? A child with a certain prescription that can't wear a certain type of lens and the only treatment is drops or the only, but there are some kids that minus 250 sphere where they could potentially be treated with atropine. They could be treated with daytime lenses. They could be treated with ortho K lenses. Soon they'll be able to be treated with eyeglass lenses. And when you leave that fully up to the parent, a lot of times there's decision overload and they end up leaving saying something like, okay, it's good to know about all this. Let me do some further research and get back to you. Ask the questions to figure out this kid and this family and say, I think the best course of treatment is going to be. If the child can wear ortho K lenses, very often, I think that's the best course of treatment because it's going to get him out of glasses during the day. He's not going to have to worry about contact lenses in school. For a child that is jumping out of your chair the minute you get close with the occluder, you have to be able to say to that family, in this case, I'm not recommending ortho K lenses. I'm recommending these other treatments. And as he gets older, We'll talk about changing that because parents are overwhelmed with this information and they're looking to you as the expert. And so take that moment to think, what is the best? You can let the parents know we've got some options for treatment. I think the best one is. And if they ask detail about the others, you give it. But a lot of parents will say, Okay, sounds good to us as well. And that's that gets the consultation from information gathering into a commitment to treatment much quicker. I love it. All right. Well, I think that's everything. We'll go ahead and turn it over to questions now. Um, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Hi, Dr. Bethany. Welcome back. Thanks, Christy. That was uh, surreal. <laughs> How are you doing? I am okay. All right. Well, uh, we've got some really great questions. Um, and for those of you that are listening, um, don't be shy. If you have questions, uh, we have we have some dedicated time to get to them. So don't hesitate to um, add them in the Q&A box. Um, and we're just going to go ahead and get started. Um, and this one is for you, Dr. Bethany. Um, uh, people would like to know what is the difference between the power practice and the power hour? Okay. The Power Hour is a podcast. It's roughly weekly podcast available on whatever platform you listen to podcasts, Apple, Spotify, um, and on our website, powerpractice.com, you click on Power Hour. And it's really just a, an attempt to provide some conversation on topics that practice owners or those who want to be practice owners or even people in the industry are interested in and talking about. We do some on practice management, profitability, financial management, sales, man uh, leadership, self-improvement, and inspirational story here and there. And anyone is welcome to listen. You can go into the archive, search past episodes. There's lots of great stuff in there. And that's just a, a fun resource to hear whenever you want to listen. Um, the Power Practice is the company that I work with. And this is a practice management consulting company. We're a team of optometrists and business leaders who help practice owners get what they want from their practices. So we do everything from a full service consulting where we are sending an optometrist into the practice, looking at everything, creating an assessment, a unique um, path forward towards your goals or smaller projects, understanding your profitability, getting a handle on your financials, preparing for a transition, bringing in an associate, things like that. So um, both are available to help doctors in very, very different ways. That's awesome. And uh, again, if you guys have not checked out the Power Hour, 
it is like one of the most amazing podcasts. Um, I routinely, I routinely recommend uh, people when I'm doing consultations uh, there for resources because they're just like really great uh, resources of like awesome, like little nuggets of, of like just really great business practice in there. And it's not just myopia management, it's like everything. So um, I just, I was talking to somebody about like a virtual like staff member uh, and how that can help ease up some like, like office admin stuff on, on your team of actual like associates in your practice. And I was like, you know, Dr. Bethany just did a, did a web- webinar on this. Like, let me, let me, let me get you that, that little, that link. So um, thanks for sharing. Um, uh, so thank our- you, Christy. You're making me blush here. <laughs> Next, our next question is, uh, what is the cost of your consultation? Now, we probably don't want to get into like the nitty gritty of talking about fees on, on a webinar, but uh, I think this is a good question um, because this comes up a lot when I'm talking to new accounts. And uh, so I, I would just say that this really varies. I have some practices that I talk to that don't charge for consultations. It's just uh, like a free information session and the fees when doctors are charging for it are all over the board. Um, so that's, that's going to be like more of like a personal decision for you. Uh, but for, for companies that are practices that are charging for consultation, I kind of see two approaches and, and maybe Dr. Bethany, you can um, speak to this. Um, some of the practices that I've talked to that are charging um, are like, okay, so the consultation is like, say, $200. But if you decide to go forward with a myopia management uh, therapy, we're going to go ahead and just apply that $200 towards the cost of the treatment. If not, it's just the $200 out of pocket and that covers you know, the doctor's time and the cost of the scans and things like that. What approach did you guys take when you were setting up your program? Um, We do pretty much exactly what you just said. We do charge for the consultation. And as we talked about um, in the, the webinar, for us, it's a it's a decision making point for the parent to even decide, is this worth pursuing further? So 100%. we do charge for it. And when the uh, family signs up for treatment within a certain time frame, I think it's 30, might be 60 days, then we'll apply that towards the cost of the treatment. Yeah. And that's it's just like a great little like nugget where you get the, um, you know, like the actual like, you know, they've committed to the process when, when they're willing to pay for coming in for the consultation. But it's also that great little nugget that, hey, you know, it, it's basically no charge to you if you decide to actually go forward with the program. So it's that great little carrot of you know, we're just going to take that right off the top. So I, I think I think practices that employ that as an option um, are usually highly su- successful with uh, scheduling the consultations and moving those over to actual therapy programs. Um, the next question we have is, um, could you give us a sample script of how you introduce myopia to like myopia management to the parents and then also the consultation? Yeah, so when let's say when you're diagnosing somebody with myopia for the first time. So this is a parent, the kid maybe failed the school screening or the parent noticed they couldn't see the um, numbers on the remote on the TV screen or something. So the parent comes in knowing that there's a vision problem. So we're talking about this is myopia. Instead of just talking about it as blurry vision, we're talking about it as a situation where the eye is growing too long, that's what's causing the blurry vision. So what we need to do is we need to take care of the immediate need now, which is that the child's vision is blurry. We're going to correct that part with a pair of glasses. And then we need to take care of the the issue of progression, that if we don't do anything, this is likely to increase, get worse, get worse, get worse year after year. And usually the parents are nodding because that's exactly what happened to them. There are things that we can do about that to slow down that progression, to limit the number of the ultimate prescription. And so we're going to schedule a consultation to have you come back in. Doctor's going to do some more testing. We're going to figure out which of the treatment options are going to be most effective for you and be able to recommend what we would do to help that situation. So we're addressing the vision with uh, the glasses and then the health of the eye with the myopia consult. Sure. And then when you actually move to the consultation, um, like, could you give us a sample of like making that professional recommendation? So um, I I know you're kind of more of the like, I I don't give them a a la carte menu of, well, you could do soft, you could do hard, you could do drop. You're you're walking into the exam room and you're like, you know, based on all the data that I've gathered, I feel like this modality is going to work the best for your child. What what does that conversation sound like uh, in in your practice? 
usually the parent is aware of other options. So we're not keeping it from them because they have that information, even walking into the consult. Mm -hmm. But when we're doing the, the consultation at the end of it, we reiterate that the main goal here is to help slow down the growth of the eye, limit the prescription as much as we can based on whatever factors we're finding. So based on the current prescription and the fact that your child is in swimming on the swim team and swimming five days a week, we're going to recommend an overnight contact lens. Ah, uh, puppy that way. Sorry. Can I cannot I, I say anything. I literally, I was, I, I was, I was literally just texting you. I was like, I literally cannot do one of these webinars without my cat crashing the webinar. Uh, um, I thought it was a dog. Tell it. I'm sorry, cat, but um, it's, it's okay. you know, we're, we're talking about the specific things that that child has that make them a better candidate for one than the other. So because your child has a low prescription, they don't have much astigmatism and they're swimming five days a week, the best treatment for them is going to be overnight ortho-K lenses. It's going to take them out of glasses. They'll be able to see clearly for swim team. You don't have to worry about contacts and goggles or anything like that. And that's what's going to be best. And sometimes the parents will ask, well, I read this here. Can't we just do eye drops? Okay, we can do eye drops. Here's what we're going to give up if we do that. But guiding them towards what is the most appropriate treatment for the child, the prescription, the age, the needs, the activities, and all of those things. Yeah. And then I think this was like an add-on question uh, to the first one. And that is, um, what would you say to parents if they decline moving forward with a therapy? So like if somebody's just like, I'm good, like I, I just, you know, like it, it sounds great, but I think we're just going to hold off right now. Like what is your, what is your follow-up to that? It's really just, this is something we still want to keep an eye on. So if we're choosing not to treat, we know that statistically it's likely that this is going to continue. We want to know at least what rate it's continuing at, make sure the vision stays clear, give us the opportunity to talk about it again. So very often, instead of saying, we'll see you in a year for an exam, this changed so much in the last year. We're not going to wait a year again. Let's see you back in six months or three months. We'll recheck the prescription, measure the eye, and at least keep the vision clear throughout the year. Yeah. Um, and then during your one-hour consult, um, what exactly is the doctor doing during that time? I think the the time allotted for the consultation is really about having time to do the tests and, and those kind of things doesn't take an hour. Very often we are cycloplegia the child, um, doing some binocular testing, particularly if we're thinking that atropine treatment is going to be appropriate. But it's really about letting the parent exhaust all of the questions that they have. Um, my partner who does these in the practice will ask the parent, what questions do you have? And let them ask. And then he says, okay, what else? What else? And it, and continues until the yep. parent doesn't have any questions left. So there are cases where that is a 25 minute consultation and there's cases where you're nudging them out the door after an hour <laughs> and 10, depending on the parent. But what we want to make sure is that the parent does not have any concerns or reasons why they wouldn't do it that go unaddressed at the consult. Yeah. And then I guess I would just add on to that too, is that um, oftentimes, like when I'm in the consultation, I'm also doing some like fact finding of my own that I probably don't do during a normal, like standard contact lens fitting. Um, one of the things that um, I, I learned really early on, especially with the orthokeratology, is that parents, for whatever reason, do not equate um, any type of dermatology product to a medication. For whatever reason, if it's, it's being applied to the skin or it's used for the skin, they just don't feel the need that they need to disclose that. And mm -hmm. we're dealing with a, we're dealing with a population where, um, you know, these kids, their bodies are changing. They have hormone fluctuations. Um, they're starting to have like things like acne and, um, a lot of the products that are used, uh, to, to manage acne are used at night. And so I've had a couple of orthokeratology kids that have come in with just like extraordinarily dry eye. 
And then I'm like, what the heck is going on here? And as it turns out, they're like, they're following all the hygiene stuff that we talked about. They're washing their hands, they're washing their face, and they're applying their salicylic acid and their retin-A creams. And then they're like instantly going for their contact lenses because we've instructed them to put those in like right before bed. So they've done all these other things. And then they're transferring like the, the creams and like, they're like, they're, they're really thick and hard to get off your hands once you've got them on there. And so for us, like, you know, just doing a little bit of fact finding um, and just, you know, like really making certain that there wasn't any, you know, like hidden products that are being used um, has really helped some of some of our uh, like outcomes and stuff like that with just overall comfort. Um, and, and it's not that like the the kids that are using these products aren't great candidates. It's just more like education as to like the order that you need to apply them. So um, I, I do. One other, one other thing going on in that in that consult, I think there's also quite a bit of trust building between yes. the doctor and the kid and the parents that what's going to come next after that is very often going to be putting an ortho K lens in the eye, which we can say it here, not in the consult, but it can be a little bit traumatic to the, it, to it the family at first. And so really building that trust, because even in the easiest cases, the parents have a lot of questions. There are going to be things that come up. They're using, even they're using atropine, they're using daytime contacts and they get a little symptom during the day. And is it from that? And is this, you know, and so they need to have a level of trust that what the doctor says is going to happen will happen. What the doctor says is okay, really is okay. And I think that that trust and rapport comes from those initial conversations. Absolutely. And um, the other thing I thought that was really important that you had mentioned is um, giving them the tools to understand uh, like what's happening and how, how they manage their symptoms, especially with that initial insertion and removal. Um, I do something really similar um, where uh, as soon as they're feeling the lens on the eye, I instruct them to look down and close their eyes because as soon as they do that, that sensation that's being driven by that upper eyelid almost goes away completely where it's, it's very manageable. And so just giving them the tools that, yep, I know it's, I know it's a little scratchy at first and it's a little weird, but as soon as you close your eyes, you know, that sensation is going to go away and that's going to be exactly how it is tonight when you go to sleep. So we can handle this. And so you've given them the tools, you know, necessary to know that, you know, even though it is a little scary that they can totally 100% handle it, you know, at home. So it's, it's a very real world experience. They've, they, they know that they can handle it. They know that they can do it. Um, so I, I absolutely love that. Um, and then we have one last question. Um, again, we, we do have a few more minutes. So if there are any straggling questions that you guys wanted to ask, go ahead and type those in now. Um, but the last one we have right now is, can your patients use the HSA funds um, to cover the consultation or myopia management therapies? Um, and then do you guys offer any sort of like payment plans or like how do you guys break out payments? Yeah, we absolutely offer a monthly payment plan and this goes through our credit card processor. And so it's much easier than giving, instead of giving a big amount, when you're giving a smaller amount per month, that's more palatable and easier for a lot of families to say, oh, okay, that's not too bad. Mm -hmm. So you put in the number, you set it for the payment, the same date every month, and it just goes, you don't have to think about it and you're you're receiving payment for the treatment. Um, I believe they can use HSA funds. If you have an official answer on that, uh, you can give it, but I am I, sure I, that many of our patients do. I, I, I will say that we we use the HSA and the FSA funds uh, very easily with all of our contact lens fittings. So I don't think it really matters whether it's for the myopia management or for um, any other type of like cosmetic fitting, um, we're, we're able to do that. So um, the other the other question um, that I wanted to bounce off of that was um, when you're charging a monthly fee, do you guys charge a larger monthly fee like like that or like a larger like down payment just to kind of make certain you're covering your costs just in case somebody cancels a credit card? Or are you more of the mindset where it happens like so infrequently that we ever have a trouble with a credit card that we just we just break it out amongst like 12, 12 months and and just hope everything's OK? Yeah, that one. It happens so infrequently that it. Yeah, it doesn't happen all that often. It doesn't yeah. happen really. Yeah, I've I've never had an issue with it either. But I was just curious. And then um, we do have we do have one other question: Is how often do you offer these therapies to a seventeen to twenty year old myope? 
Um, I think if the myopia is changing and it's it's part of the conversation. So if you're seeing somebody from 17, 18, 19, 20, their prescription is stable, we're probably not talking about it. But if you think back to optometry school and how many of us, I think it was the old SUNY yearbooks. I'm probably dating myself here, but it used to have next to each student's picture, their starting refraction and their ending refraction. And you could see the myopic progression in the optometry school class. So I think when someone's prescription is changing, it is appropriate to talk to them about what you may be able to do. I think you be honest with them that the studies have not been done in that specific age group. It's a different conversation. They may not have a lifestyle that allows them to wear certain types of treatments as easily as a seven, eight or nine-year-old, but it's making them aware. And at that age, they're very much going to be active participants in that decision. Yeah. And I, I think I would, I would take that exact same approach too, where it's like, if it, if it looks like it's a concerning amount of progression and especially like as they're approaching, like, you know, what I would consider like a danger zone of like that higher myo where we would start running risk factors for, you know, like retinal detachments and myopic maculopathy. Uh, it's, it's definitely a conversation I'd be willing to have, even though they're outside of what we consider like a traditional myopia management candidate. One thing so. that also comes from having those conversations is even with older adults, the people in their 30s, where you're not going to be treating their myopic progression, talking to them about there being options for myopia management is arming them with information so that they get into the mindset of when they have kids, they know. Because I think the LASIK surgeons did a really good uh, job of that, where we saw a generation of kids grow up waiting to be old enough to have LASIK. Parents would be asking when the kid was seven, eight years old. So now you're teaching them this is going to be available. Oh, do you have children? No, no, no children yet. Okay, when you do, (laughs) if you do. There's, there's something that we can do for this. And a lot of times they're really happy to hear that. Yeah, no. And that's, and that's, that's a conversation that I've had with, with a lot of my higher miles too, is like, wow, you're, you know, and I phrase it a little bit nicer, but it's essentially like, wow, your vision's terrible. You know, like, do you have kids? We should talk, you know, um, it just any, any type of opportunity that I have to, to spread the awareness of myopia management, I, I take advantage of it. So even, even like my neighbors here, like we have, we have one that, I watched their child's glasses get thicker and I'm like, we should talk like, <laughs> like this, like I've, I've seen, I've seen his glasses. Like I've, it's got, it's had to have changed at least twice this year. So we should talk, you know? So at any opportunity you have to spark that conversation, I think is always, always valuable. So I think that was the last question we have. Um, I'll give it another second just to see if anything else pops up. Otherwise I think we're done. So I, I want to thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, it's been such a pleasure having you here. Um, for our attendees, if you have any questions, um, don't hesitate to um, email me. I'm going to go ahead and put my email in the chat box. Um, you can also schedule a like one-on-one consultation if you want to um, discuss things in greater detail. Um, I'm happy to, to set up a Zoom meeting with you one-on-one. Um, and thanks for joining us for our three-part series. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you.